office down on uh, one second. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. Um, thank you for being with us. My name is George Audi. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Dirk. Uh, we are a Dubai and, uh, and Detroit-based MIT spin-off and Texas alum. And we focus on road safety. Um, we won yesterday the Smart City Startup of the Year. and happy to tell you more about it this, after the session. The reason I'm with you today is not to talk about Dirk, but to actually uh, discuss with our distinguished uh, guests um, an important topic, which is connectivity, the role of the vehicle versus the mobile device. I'm excited to be moderating today a panel of distinguished guests, and uh, we will be covering uh, a range of topics from system integration, shared mobility, car multimedia, and VC investing related to connectivity. We have today with us uh, Joe Gomley, from, uh, he's the founder of DigiDrive Systems. We have Christopher Louis, who is uh, from business development manager uh, from Vulog. Stefan Burkla, he is the global customer lead, VP of Cult uh, Car Multimedia in, from Bosch. And Mark uh, Marinucci Mar Mar is the principal in, uh, of Hella Ventures. The way we'll structure our um, panel today will be half presentation and half Q&A. So each uh, panelist will go to the stadium for five to seven minutes and then will present their view on this topic. And then we'll have a Q&A uh, from the audience and some questions that I prepared for our guests. So please first join me in welcoming our distinguished guests. First, I uh, would like to invite uh, Joe Gromley, the founder of DigiD, uh, DigiDrive Systems. Uh, Joe is the founder, CEO of DigiDrive Systems and president of GSE, an innovator in systems integration. He holds 14 patents in system platform and novel business methods. And he, previous to that, he held positions at Ford, ranging from a technical specialist to the company's first director of system engineering. And during most of his career, he was selected to start new ventures as electronics became more prominent in modern times from rockets and industrial controls to applications in modern vehicles. Joe, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Discover for yourself the wonders of the DigiDrive world to systematically guide vehicle and connectivity. Here is a communication system template that I designed 59 years ago. It was the country's main determinant to the Soviet Sputnik threats. It had to be right. The table shows the system roles, from mission and mode to devices that even operated without electrical power. Command and control followed a strict hierarchy. Only the president could give the World War III launch command. Modern connectivity is also serious business. Applications differ from Commuting to wood site, uh, work site operations. Actions of smart devices need to be nested in fundamentally sound architecture structures, addressing personal systems. Introducing the architecture of everything, a first mover world leadership platform, solving industry's problems of lack of overall control and practical personalization, seamlessly blending mobility markets and technology together. Its breakthrough design intertwines systems interfaces with the optimized intelligence and control through a revolutionary, flexible computational kernel chip. It is a pivotal intellectual property, returning more than just money. DigiDrive's architecture artfully and creatively blends controls originally found in military and industrial systems. U8 is the computational kernel and it's the secret sauce. Directing smart peripherals, the UA chip is the ultimate embodiment in a crisp and compact package. The first mover claiming the high ground first has unprecedented market technological and legal advantages for others to follow. Several market giants are acting like they own the high ground, but they have actually missed the leadership ride to the top. Climbing the ladder with incremental applications, discovering that there is only room for one first mover at the top. 
With digitized reigning architecture of everything, there's practically nothing they can't do through individual personalization and comprehensive control capabilities. The intellectual properties were secured for progressively interacting of smart peripherals, like on-the-go travel features, rapid repair and maintenance programs, all under the centribute control umbrella. Its miniaturized platform supports all the customer's personal doings, overcoming distracting technology overload onto world mobile leadership. System control authority is the most important of these technologies. Through natural industrial controls has evolved from manual through electronic to supervisory controls, producing a sharply focused enterprise. On the other hand, the auto industry control evolution experience an application aberration. In the 70s, with embedded engine controls rushing to satisfy regulations without ever looking back for more comprehensive controls, like digitized centribute controls, eliminating scattered mobile controls. Poor system design is the biggest problem with interfaces, as J.D. Powers reports, and it's exaggerated by poor technology and market coordination. Every place we see smart things performing a bunch of dumb actions, and that will persist until the system approach changes to an entirely new mindset. Such an approach, the seven-step system strategy, was presented at the inaugural Automotive D two years ago and is a virtuous method optimizing and personalizing the driver interface with services that continually stretch and reform themselves. DigiDrive prototypes demonstrated the high-tech, soft-touch data center system supported by a human machine expert, by our buddy, playing a vital role in post and pre-acquisition connected services. Where am I at here? Yeah. Another assistant, Dr. Digidrive, I lost my place, sorry, uses the Goldilocks approach, the ADAP method, the advanced driver assistant personal touch, adjusting customer once from operations to travel features, serving in a way that others are only beginning to imagine. All this capability is bounded into a single chip package, well beyond anything seen to date. And where all these cap comprehensive capabilities go, so goes the world following DigiDrive's first mover platform. The good news, it's all available, from acquiring the intellectual properties and know-how to licenses for both current and future users. Attractive exclusive venture investments are all available for those that want to build their own small fortune. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, George. Next, I'd like to invite Stefan Berkley from yeah. Bosch to the podium. Stefan is currently the VP Sales at Bosch Car Multimedia Division in North America. In this position, he provides leadership to a cross-functional customer sales team, including developing a global customer strategy to drive sales growth and guiding product innovation. He is located in Plymouth, Michigan, and is responsible for a global team and with staff in US, Europe, and Asia. Oh, thank you. Very excited to be here today um, uh, to talk about our topic, uh, mobile versus uh, the car. But actually, I would like to take a little twist on it because at the end of the day, <clears throat> it's much more a joint solution than the one or the other. So, all right. there we go. So, I think it is without doubt the smartphone is our center hub of uh, our daily living as of today, right? With all the communication features, we don't need to dig in there. But we strongly believe that there are many use cases within the car where the car and the feature set of a car can support yourself much better than a smartphone could do. So, looking a little bit in your daily life, um, with more and more data and uh, sensors coming into the car through safety functionality, um, we get a complete new data set into the car, which we not only can use for safety, but also for additional features to make your experience in the car a much perfect one. 
<clears throat> so grabbing two examples would be, for example, driver state monitoring, a safety feature we're introducing to improve the, uh, to recognize the driver drowsiness while uh, on a long ride, right? Uh, or a forward-facing camera to detect collision warning. So with these two technologies in the car, we create new data inputs out of a safety side, which is still the first priority for Bosch, but we can reuse this data also to Im improve uh, the services. So as said, the smartphone is still the center of your communication. Therefore, the first step for us and has to be to create a seamless integration of the smartphone into the car. Because at the end of the day, the end customer still wants to be connected while driving, so we have to find solutions and working on different technologies to do that seamless integration to, at the end of the day, reduce distraction while driving and present a safe ride to the end customer. But as I said, there's still a lot of use cases in the car where the car can support better. Let's grab those two technologies as an example. Um, as said, the driver state monitoring camera is already in place um, for safety features, but what a smartphone cannot do is to look at your face the whole time. Right? But uh, the driver state monitoring camera can detect, for example, emotion changes by looking at your face, measuring skin temperature, me measuring the breathing of your nostrils, uh, measuring the moisture of your skin. And out of these data sets, we can now create algorithms to detect if you're positively excited, negatively excited. The same holds true for the forward-facing camera. A smartphone cannot give you a live picture of the surrounding of the car at every given point in time. So we can use this to, for example, detect road signs, and I will get later to the use case behind that. And last but not least, also the smartphone will not learn my favorite behavior and functionality with inside the car and learn based on that. My future car in future will learn that I love my seat heating, but I only love it for 10 minutes. So it will turn it on automatically and turn it off for me within 10 minutes. So these are things where we get a whole flow of information into the car and data, which we want to use. So I brought two example use cases, and there are many more around it uh, with me. So picture a situation you're driving down the road. Your forward-facing camera is detecting a road sign, in this example, a food exit sign. At the same time, the uh, driver state monitoring cam picks up that you create a positive emotion because you're hungry and you saw your favorite window on that sign. And now we have big data collected, but can move it to valuable data as we understand that the right time and the right moment to offer you the right service, which could be, for example, a coupon in your infotainment system for exactly this vendor. And it's like magic for you that you thought about maybe having a burger from McDonald's or Burger King, whoever that would be, and magically you get an offer. Could also be as simple as pushing the um, address of this vendor into your navigation and you just confirm, yeah, I want to go there, and it adds it automatically there. So this is one example where we are working currently to bring basically sense of fusion together to create this experience and to round up the technology picture behind. We work uh, with companies like Sivo, who established currently a, a very strong marketplace in, in the car, where third-party vendors can, can bring in their offerings and to merge those two technologies to create this uh, a true positive experience instead of pushing random offers to you to really do it in the right time at the right place. A second example I want to present to you is looking a little bit ahead in time. Uh, autonomous driving, I think it's without question that sooner or later we will all uh, share rides in autonomy, autonomous driving cars. For sure that presents by itself from a driving side of point a, a huge op a opportunity and challenge at the same time to, to make this car moving in a safe fashion through the city. But not having a driver, a dedicated driver in such a cab presents a whole bunch of other topics we have to take care of. So one, for example, is you need to know how many pe who and how many people are in that car at a given point in time to secure a safe ride. So you could do that with your smartphone, but at the end of the day, you, you could turn off your connectivity, you could leave the smartphone at home, or even leave it behind. So therefore, you get, a, you get an indication of how many people are in there, but at the end of the day, it's not a secured information. So therefore, you need a two-way in, uh, in, uh, identification of that information. Um, so therefore, we use cameras with face ID detection to give you this uh, additional information um, of who and how many so that you can launch and start the ride accordingly. So wrapping up my, my presentation, just to teaser examples of where we are heading, 
as said, a seamless integration of the smartphone is key because at the end of the day, everybody wants to stay connected even while driving. But secondly, we need to use all the sensors, all the data we're anyway collecting in the, ta uh, in the car to move those together to present the perfect uh, ride experience for the end customer. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Next, I would like to invite uh, Marco Marinucci from Hella Ventures. Marco is uh, a principal in Hella Venture. He has a strong uh, experience uh, working in the automotive industry. Um, his, his background in, in uh, corporate venture capital with Hella Ventures spans, uh, now, I believe, more than six years. And uh, he has a strong academic background in electrical engineering and business uh, with an MBA and PhD that's ongoing. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, all right. Uh, I think I push here. Well, I guess we can skip that um, intro. I guess I misunderstood that. So, um, <laughs> and it's longer and even longer. There you go. All right. Um, so, um, w what I want to do is like talk a little bit about um, Hella Ventures. So, Hella Ventures is the venture arm of um, of Hella, and uh, I was a co-founder, and, and and now I, um, I, I run uh, Hella Ventures, and I wanted to. Uh, basically, um, you know, talk a little bit about what we do and then um, uh, fit into uh, the uh, topic of, of connected vehicle. Uh, so generally, I want to cut the short, but like we do basically typical scouting. We do uh, partnering if we find targets that are not really um, ultimately uh, investment targets um, that we uh, don't classify as uh, venture capital targets. And then, of course, we do investing. We do Series A, Series B investing. Um, we don't do seed investing. Uh, for reasons that I, I think most um, uh, corporate venture capital arms ha have understood that we really look for more advanced companies that we can uh, engage in and then ultimately connect with our business unit and bring a product to market. Um, we are in Palo Alto, we're a team of four. Um, yeah, so basically um, we, we did it a little bit different than, than some, some other companies. So we brought in com people from the automotive industry and, uh, and taught them venture capital. Uh, versus doing it vice versa that have tr strong ties to the to the business unit and know the business unit leaders uh, which allows us uh, different than most other uh, corporate VCs to not only invest but also promise a startup that we will bring um, a product uh, jointly to market um, so our main investment areas are yeah automated driving connected car um, electrification and, and lighting innovation so we'll, we'll touch base on the connected car um, Hella is a big player in radar lidar and and, um, and camera so uh, we will um, also be playing a part in, in the autonomous driving and that's why we invest in, in, in that field um, some of our portfolio companies uh, are in the connected car space and, and I want to pick out uh, specifically a company called Carforce um, so um, we, we see the connected car and connected vehicle um, uh, the, there are many use cases that come up, and, and we want to focus on the use cases that are really practical and, and not so much in the, uh, in, in the deep uh, big data uh, analytics because we, we think that um, if a service is not really accurate uh, and precise, then, then it's, it's not a good service. Uh, I mean, see at your dry, uh, dry, driver draws in us um, detection today, it's basically terrible. Um, so what we did is um, we invested in a connected car company that collects uh, failure codes out of the car and sends them to the cloud. Um, so you might have seen all these dongles in, in the field, many companies with um, ODB2 dongles. And, and we, we don't really believe in the uh, B2C market because I, I think that's like um, a, a market that is not very large. There are not very, many people that would buy dongles to put them in their cars and then see their RPMs live or something like that. But what we think a, a good use case for connected car today where not most cars are connected is to basically take these dongles uh, give them for free to uh, independent car dealerships and uh, extract the failure codes out of, uh, give them to, uh, for free to the car dealerships. The car dealerships give them, uh, uh, sorry, the car dealerships give them for free to their customers. We um, charge basically the car dealerships and the, the car dealerships can give them to their customers and every time their customers' cars break down, they can uh, effectively extract all the failure codes and and do a remote diagnostic today in today's cars. Every car basically has an OBD2 port. <coughs> so that's, that's the connected car um, uh, objective that we have today uh, that we can bring in the field um, today. And yeah, of, of, of course, we also um, look at um, camera-based um, uh, connected car services. Um, but 
I, I think that's, um, so we have done many POCs with companies, um, for example, doing um, uh, emotion recognition. Uh, uh, and we see that it, the problem is more complicated than it initially seems. I, I think Bosch is much better in solving problems like that, that, that companies in the startup space, because you need massive resources, massive data to, to, to collect before you can actually make uh, accurate predictions that, that are useful. Um, the, the other thing that we do in the connected car space is um, a company called Breezometer out of, um, out of Israel. Uh, what, what they uh, basically do is an air quality uh, aggregator. They aggregate air quality data from all over the world. And um, Hella offers um, air quality sensors. So instead of having stationary air quality measurements, um, we had the idea, let's connect our air quality uh, sensor that is a high-end sensor. It goes only into uh, you know, premium cars, not necessarily in your one series or Mini Cooper. And then um, update that data to, uh, to increase the, the quality of the maps and ultimately then resell the, the better uh, data to the same customers that ultimately also bought the sensor just so that they can sell, uh, implement this data into their lower end vehicles or to weather stations or um, other third party uh, providers. Um, I would say, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, maybe very briefly for every startup, if we have startups here in the room. Um, so who we are is basically we're uh, an off the balance sheet investor that invests in series A and Bs. Uh, we typically don't take any exclusivities from, uh, from startups. We invest up to $4 million. We've done um, 11 investments so far. We've been around for three years. Um, and, and what we really promise is that if a startup engages with Hella Ventures, we only will invest if we really see a path to a product jointly. And, and if we don't see that, then, then we just wouldn't do it. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's about Hella Ventures. Um, I look forward to um, uh, engaging to uh, the discussion with these gentlemen. Thank you, Mark. Last but not least, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Christopher Louis to the podium. Uh, Christopher is the International Business Development Manager at Vulog, and he supports uh, Vulog's growth ambitions in North America. He brings deep knowledge of the mobility industry after spending four years with Zipcar North America and supporting the launch of three new markets. Chris now guides uh, Vulog's new car share and scooter share clients in building their own successful mobility brands. Chris, the floor is yours. Perfect, thank you, uh, thank you, George. Uh, you can hear me all right. Um, so, as George mentioned, my name is Christopher Louis, uh, International Business Development Manager uh, for Vulog. Vulog is essentially a white-labeled shared mobility platform provider. We're providing all the tech necessary to get a car sharing, scooter sharing, moped sharing service off the ground. And when I say tech, I'm specifically referring to a SaaS-based platform and in-vehicle hardware, a telematics unit. Um, now, before I get into the role of the vehicle versus the mobile phone and how we see that playing out in the mobility space, I do want to touch on what Vulog is, um, who our clients are, so, so we can kind of set the stage on the discussion. So, perfect. Uh, so our clients really range everywhere from large OEMs down to small startups. Uh, from an OEM perspective, I know we're in Detroit, so we should talk OEMs. Um, we work with PSA, uh, so Peugeot Citroen, French-based manufacturer, uh, Dongfeng in China, Kia in Spain. Um, we've done integrations with Renault vehicles as well, and we actually just signed a global agreement uh, with a European OEM. Can't share too much beyond that just yet, other than the fact that they'll be launching a car sharing service with us about mid-2019. So expect to hear more about that in, in the coming months. Um, beyond OEMs, like I said, very diversified. Our clients are insurance companies, uh, dealership groups, oil and gas companies, um, small startups, like I had mentioned. These car sharing, scooter sharing projects, they range anywhere from 150 vehicles to 1,500 vehicles. Um, and like I said, they can comprise of cars, mopeds, scooters, you name it, all in the same service. So what exactly are we providing uh, to these clients? Uh, we call it the Vulog Mobility Platform, as I mentioned. Uh, if you look up there at the top, we call that, again, the, our cloud platform. That's the SaaS-based platform that I mentioned before. That's really the, the epicenter, the, the nexus of connecting all the different tools that you need to run uh, shared mobility service. So API based uh, cloud platform. On the left side there, left side, sorry, uh, you'll see 
uh, operator tools. So fleet management platform, uh, reporting tools, machine learning tools. So really, what does a operator need in order to run an efficient service? We provide that all to them. On the right side, you'll see direct interactions with the end client. So we're providing a white label application uh, that allows the user to register, to find a vehicle, book a vehicle, unlock a vehicle. So we build that and then brand it for our clients. You're never gonna see a Vulog car on the streets. You're never gonna see a Vulog app in the App Store. It's an entirely white label solution. Last but not least, and definitely pertaining to this conversation, is connectivity to the vehicle. So Vulog's about 12 years old now. We, you know, we evolved out of a scenario where there wasn't IoT connections in, in many vehicles. So in order to connect these vehicles to a car sharing network, we build what's called the VooBox. It's a piece of hardware, connects into the OBD port, um, and we have a variety of accessories uh, that plug into that, and I'll touch on what those are in, in just a moment. But dialing back to the conversation of the phone versus the vehicle, and you know, which one is, is most important. From a mobility standpoint, I would argue to say that both are equally important, both are entirely necessary. There's going to be instances, and I'll touch on it in just a second, where someone needs to interact with the car sharing service without being in front of the vehicle. The vehicle needs to communicate data without having any interaction with the user and their mobile phone. So both need to operate independently, and then obviously both need to come together and provide a harmonious service to the user once the, the user is actually in the vehicle. So let me touch on a typical car sharing user experience. And again, I, I reference car sharing, but this could be applicable to scooter sharing, moped sharing as well. So, if we look at registration, when I am registering for a car sharing service, I don't need to be in front of the vehicle. I just need to sign up on my phone or on my computer. So I need direct connectivity to this service from my mobile phone. That said, let's say I now want to access a vehicle. We're gonna need communication from both the vehicle and from the phone. The vehicle is going to need to say, all right, I'm at this location. This is my fuel level. This is a status of, you know, I, I'm clean. I, I have no damage on me, so I'm ready to be rented. The user needs to know where those vehicles are. They need to be able to request that vehicle. And then when it comes time to start the trip, unlock the vehicle. So there needs to be a tight cohesion between these two assets. If I skip down to the, uh, it, you, you can kind of get the idea of, of where I'm going with this. And if you look at the, the last step, um, we call, so at the end of the trip, when a user wants to finish their trip, we call, um, in the car sharing industry, it's called end trip criteria. So it's a certain set of conditions that need to be met in order for a user to end their trip. Let's say, uh, so the vehicle needs to know the windows are closed and the doors are locked. It needs to know that the keys are back in the key holder, that the car is parked in the right location, and it needs to know that there's a certain level of fuel in the vehicle. Once that end trip criteria is confirmed, then the user can use their phone to lock the vehicle, walk away, and carry on with their day. So again, that's a, another good overlap between both the vehicle and the end user. Last but not least, I, I just want to touch on some accessories. So I, I mentioned before those accessories, we build the VUBOX, that's again our telematics unit, and then a few accessories that plug into that, uh, that VUBOX. These are helping to augment the user experience. So at the end of the day, Vulog is a SaaS-based platform. That is our core business. We're really providing this hardware as a means to an end. Right? We, we're not in the business of selling hardware, we're providing it to connect these vehicles. But as we went through the process of, of growing our company over the last 12 years, we've come to realize that you need to have more than just a mobile phone in the vehicle to provide a good user experience. You need to, have, you need to bring the user experience in front of the user. So, good example, parking LED, it's the one there in the bottom left. It's a simple LED light, plugs into our VUBOX, shows up on the dash. It's green when you're in the right parking zone and you can end your trip. It's red when you're not. So this is a direct visual cue that the user doesn't have to look at their phone to see where they are to be able to tell them, yes, you can end your trip or no, you can't end your trip. Speaker is another good example. Uh, that gives you audio cues um, at any point throughout the trip. It's connected directly in to the vehicle battery. So it, the vehicle doesn't need to be on in order for this speaker to work and it can tell someone, welcome to your trip. It can tell them, please fill up on gas before ending your trip. Please put the keys back. Please roll the windows up. You get the idea. So it is bringing you know, certain levels of both audio and visual 
mobile phone and vehicle interactions to provide a, an ideal user experience. So I, I, I hope that helps to, to show our, our stance that we really do feel that both vehicle and mobile phone are important. And that's it for me. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. So we still have uh, 15 more minutes. Uh, we'll get things started with a couple of questions, and then we'll open it to the public. Uh, first question has come to mind. Um, so in, in our space, we will work at, at Dirk on V2X connected vehicle technology in the safety space. Um, and we are focusing on really being connected in the vehicle. Um, you, you mentioned that the phone can be off, could be, could be on, so we cannot have reliable um, information from just the mobile. But I would like to, to, to hear from you, you know, this is safety. There is also entertainment. How do you see the priority or the balance when it comes to the mobile uh, versus the vehicle and not just you know, beyond safety when we look at entertainment services and, and other um, basically uh, other services that, that uh, the mobility um, industry is offering in, in the new era of connected vehicles? Uh, if I can say from a car sharing standpoint, I, I would I would think that really where, where Vulog's customer facing applications start and where they excel is really pre-trip and trip access and getting into the vehicle. And then from a, from a safety standpoint, I mean, you obviously don't want someone looking down at their phone, right, to look for parking, to look for whatever it might be. Um, so that's kind of why we've built those, those accessories, mm. to pull people away from looking at their phone and bring the, the car sharing experience a bit more in front of them or around them in the, in the car sharing space. And I, I would say with you know, the, the role of uh, Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, these are really acting as mirroring tools for a mobile phone. So you know, rather than looking down at your phone and looking at where I can find parking, well, just have the Vulog app on Android Auto or Apple CarPlay, have it show up in front of you. Sure, people can definitely be distracted by having that screen in front of them, and we're seeing these be these screens become bigger and bigger as uh, as we as we go on. Um, but from a from a car sharing perspective, really where where we step in at least our perspective is we're providing the tools to enable a trip. Mm. We don't need to provide entertainment. So <coughs> maybe adding from the. You mentioned car to car communication, or let's widen it a little bit. Let's say car to X infrastructure cars and so on. Um, actually, the networks behind the smartphone, right, with 5G coming, will enable a lot of safety features in that space, which will be crucial. Um, when the cars start communicating, we, we will have the possibility to look around the corner for things you as a driver cannot see yet. See yet uh, if that's passengers which are approaching or crossing, where we can see through cameras in the infrastructure that they might go over the street or a bicycle is coming and give uh, certain warnings. And you mentioned um, on the entertainment side, it's fully correct, right? That's a part of seamless integration, and Apple and uh, Android are working on solutions there. But at the end of the day, what we are working on is to go a step beyond that. Let's let's make an example. Um, I want to be connected, right, when I'm driving. I want to stay informed. I want to stay in touch with my social life. But not necessarily that needs to happen in every given second. So let's, uh, for example, make an example. You, you, you're driving on a highway and a traffic, you approach a tra traffic jam and you need to do a braking, a hard braking maneuver. Is that the moment where I need to be informed that I just received a text message? <clears throat> maybe not, right? So maybe it can hold off five seconds until I finish my maneuver, I'm back in a safe state with my car. And this is where we need to come together, the network, the, the smartphone, the entertainment, but then the safety side of things, where the safety assistance systems which see this traffic jam can give that information to the car, we receive that input, we hold it up for a few seconds, you're safe again, and then we let you know you received a text message. And these are the things where the collaboration really starts now mm. and enables a lot of more safety, which does not sacrifice entertainment at the same given time. I'll give a, an example on uh, system integration of safety. I use the term centributed. I made that term up. It's a combination of centralized and distributed. 
So if information comes in from the roadside, let's just make this up like an icy condition. It goes to the supervisor in the car, and the car then also adjusts the appropriate subsystem, like the vehicle dynamic system, for instance, to be more optimized for a braking condition. And so the idea of uh, a supervisor in the car and then pushing it down to the lowest control level that's possible, where you have peer-to-peer -peer, uh, cooperation, is one example of how you use centributed control. There, there's many others. I just happen to latch on to this system one. But thank yeah, you. May, maybe one last opinion on it. Um, so I, I, I think, like, um, you know, smartphones are a huge distraction. It's a huge problem. Uh, and it's not going to go away. Like, the new generation, the, every kid that, you know, turns 16, is a little bit worse than the kid last year. So it's not going to go away. So I think for, for the automotive industry and the startup industry and innovation industry, our task is to figure out how to build like safety systems or ADA systems that prevent accidents. But like to, to think that we will have systems that, that basically, t or the legislation tell people not to do it, they're going to do it anyway. So I think where the big money is to be earned and, and the products that we can sell is products that basically enhance like the security by ultimately taking the driving task or uh, you know, in certain times the, the responsibility of driving away from you. Um, and, and one thing, for example, we are doing, we invest in a company that can pick up uh, any electromagnetic signal within 500 meters and uh, um, a, a range of 500 meters and accuracy of 30 centimeters, so one foot. So our idea is advanced, um, uh, advanced driver assistance systems, or ADAS, could be even if you are, um, let's say, be, be, between two cars, there's a passenger, uh, there's there's a pedestrian, but almost every pedestrian today has a phone on them, so and they have an electromagnetic signal. So if we could pick that up, that would be, for example, a huge enhancement on security. But um, I, I, yeah, I, I think that the distraction is there and it's there to stay. So shifting a bit the topic from uh, safety versus entertainment and where this uh, lies in in. Uh, this balance between mobility, between the mobile, the, the phone, and vehicles, and looking at data ownership. Um, so the phones we own, the phone, the telco companies also have access to our data. The cars, it's a bit different. We also own the car. The data is, there is, you know, question of who owns the data, whether it's OEM, the tier ones. And how do you see this data ownership impacting um, this balance? And the second part of the question is, how can, um, the, if, if, it's, if we're looking within the vehicles, how can the OEMs and tier ones monetize the data in a good way to actually make it cheaper or even for free for the users? I'll give you one view on that, if you mind. Uh, I think you need to look at your personal data as your personal currency. And only somebody can use that if you give them their permission. You know, we have all kinds of search engines right now that just pick up all kinds of information on you, but you haven't authorized it. And so I think there needs to be a two-way consideration on addressing that as a privacy issue. And if you looked at it as a currency, and that's one of the things that I've been pushing in this DigiDrive thing, we will give you certain features if you allow us to use your personal information. And it needs to be a two-way street like that. You can't have the Googles of the world just snatching up information and uh, without your permission. And I think that, that's one aspect of it. For one as well, um, we think it's key that transparency um, is, is given to the end customer. The owner is at the end of the day the end customer who gives the data. And to provide a, a safe system that you know that it's properly handled and it's safe stored. Uh, but also to give you the transparency of what happens with your data so that you, fitting to what you said, <clears throat> have the choice to decide in your currency, do I want to give the data for that service I receive or not? And this is, at the end, we believe, the key um, to handle data properly. Yeah, I, I ultimately, I, I couldn't agree more. It's basically a currency. And I think, um, you know, the more the people become aware that data privacy is a thing and you actually, you know, stuff is worth something, um, the more you can actually create a business model where you can say, okay, depending on the model that you're driving, let's say you have a front-facing camera, you collect data and you can build HD maps out of it, for example, or you can pick up rain or can sell it to a weather company or something like that. So you, you, as an OEM, I, I envision that, that you could offer a package, like let's say the data you know, 
give back package if you want to. You sell the data back and you get a discount of $3,000 on the car. Uh, with that, everybody has an incentivation, uh, but it's also very clear and transparent, so um, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, I, I don't know how much I, I can add to that. I would say it's definitely plausible that you, you could have that scenario in a, in a car sharing service, but I, I don't think we've gotten to that point yet. I, I, think, I think operators are really focusing on providing value to the end consumer. Um, at the end of the day, and you know, it, it could get to a point where yes, you can have a, a discounted service in exchange for your data. Where are we, if you're familiar with Wavecar um, in LA, they offer free car sharing in exchange for a branded vehicle that advertises while you're driving around the city. But from a from a data sharing perspective, I, I, I don't think I don't think these operators are at that point yet. But it it, it could come down the down the road. Great. So I think we have time for. One or two questions. Um, so, any question from the audience? Uh, oh, sorry. There are not too many people, so. Uh, how do you intend to, uh, like, who are you going to sell the hardware to? Is it the OEM, the car manufacturer? or? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, 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 if you didn't hear the, the question was, who do we sell the hardware to? Yes. I mean, if, if it is an OEM that's our client, then for sure, we provide that hardware as a way to connect that vehicle. Um, but as I mentioned before, we're not necessarily, our, our business is being a SaaS platform. We're selling the hardware to provide that, uh, to connect that vehicle. But I mean, five years down the road, most OEM vehicles are going to come with IoT enablement built in and we we can connect to that. We're already connecting to, to OEMs in that regard. So I would say this this third party hardware is more of a, a bridge to get to that future IoT enablement that we're that we're expecting. I, I was wondering if there could be something that's like an aftermarket attachment or something that a vehicle that's added to the network could yeah, yeah. put that. Yeah, yeah. So these vehicles I mean we, we have worked with OEMs in the past where vehicles come off the line with Vulog hardware already built in. But yeah there's majority of the projects that we work with, clients that we work with, they'll buy a fleet of 1,200 Toyota Priuses, not connected. We teach them how to integrate the hardware and they're off to the races. Any other question? So everyone is ready to go, huh? <laughs> Thank you very much for attending. Thank you for our guest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.